live here, uh, streaming live to the super, super secret Lions of Liberty Pride Facebook group for our patrons. Uh, but, kitty cats, stop me if you've heard this before. I've got another debate for you today. Another debate with friend of the show, host of Part of the Problem, Dave Smith. He is back for another round in the Lions of Liberty fight pit. Dave, are you ready to roar? Rah, rah, motherfucker. Here we go again. I had a feeling. And, and you know, this time we've got uh, kind of a different type of opponent. This is not actually one of your online critics at all. This is someone who is actually a fan, someone who's been a, a fan of your show and a member of the Part of the Problem Inner Circle uh, pre-Zuckening. He is former Maine State Senator Eric Brakey. Eric, are you ready to roar? Roar. Let's go for it. Excellent. So, uh, gentlemen, today we are not uh, debating, as we have on several other shows, whether Dave, Dave is racist or a member of the alt-right. Or actually, I don't know. I have no idea what sort of accusations Eric might bring up throughout this. But you did. No promises. You, you promised me that our next debate will be whether I'm a Nazi again. Of course. I'll take one off, but then we're well, going right back into it. We're going to see. I mean, we discussed before the show. Like th Those do seem to be pretty pretty darn good good for ratings. <laughs> so we'll see if a uh, more substantive topic uh, gets you know gets more traction, less traction, and the market will decide. If uh, if debating whether you're a Nazi gets any more downloads, that's, that's what we're going to be doing at the end of the day. But for today, we're going to be debating not really a specific criticism. Like I said, uh, Eric, you're a big fan of Dave's work. Uh, we're going to be debating really more strategy. And you guys are both, uh, I guess, what you consider like Ron Paul Republicans. Uh, however, one wants to define that. But you were both inspired by Ron Paul to become libertarians, to get involved and active within the liberty movement. You've both done that in different ways uh, over the years. Uh, but now you are both. we are both looking at a, a, a time right here, which many people are seeing as sort of a, a turning point for libertarians, especially after the last year of uh, seeing lockdowns and, and the, the type of stuff that only Alex Jones could have really dreamed uh, coming to the world has been happening right in front of our eyes. And um, I think a lot of us see this as a, as a moment, like a moment where libertarians have to either take charge and take the lead or, I don't know, just give up and go go hide somewhere in Antarctica. But uh, both of you are still very active in the liberty movement, and both of you are sort of have been, I guess as of late, uh, Eric, for you know, a good number of years now, have been pushing forward specific strategies to do so within the political arena. Uh, so I'm just going to lay out uh, this proposition. This actually was brought up by by Eric, by Senator Brakey, uh, the idea for this debate. So I will let Senator Brakey go first. But first, I just want to lay out the proposition itself. So what we will be debating today is the question, is the best path forward for the Ron Paul liberty movement to focus on, one, growing our influence in the Libertarian Party, that's the position Dave will be taking, or two, taking control of the GOP of the Republican Party away from the neoconservatives. That is the position that uh, Senator Brakey will be uh, speaking for. So that being said, uh, Eric, this was your idea, this debate. This was your idea, this subject to, to talk about today. So I'm going to let you go first. You've got five minutes or so because I'm not that strict on these things. Awesome, Mark. Well, uh, Mark, thank you so much for hosting this. It's great to be back on the Lions Liberty podcast. Thank you, Dave, for doing this debate. As was mentioned, I'm a, you know, I've been listening to uh, Dave's podcast and, and Lions of Liberty for years. This will probably be the friendliest debate Dave's had in a while. Um, and uh, anyway, I look forward to it. We, we largely agree on ideological grounds. This is a debate of strategy. Uh, Mark said I should probably introduce myself. I'm, I'm probably not as well known by the audience here as Dave is. Uh, my short version of my story, I got started back in 2010 just as a as a you know Ron Paul liberty activist. I became a staffer on Ron Paul's campaign. Uh, became the state director of Maine in 2012, uh, where we won the state. We took over the state Republican Party. I ran for state Senate two years later, defeated a 36-year Democrat incumbent uh, in the state Senate, passed constitutional carry, uh, right to try, welfare reform, expanded medical cannabis. And I was the Republican nominee for United States Senate in the state of Maine uh, in 2018. Uh, and I've been fighting for liberty ever since. So that's the short version of who I am, but here we are, we're, we're debating strategy. Now, what prompted me calling for this debate is Dave, uh, who I'm, again, a big fan of and I've been listening to for years, has been lately calling and urging Ron, the Ron Paul Liberty Movement to spend our energies taking over the Libertarian Party through the Mises Caucus. But I'm here to argue and explain why, really, the, the, the most effective strategy is to spend those energies instead defe defeating the neoconservatives inside the GOP and using the Republican Party as the vehicle uh, to save our country. Now, to understand who is right in this debate, I think that we have to start by asking a few basic fundamental questions. And the, the first and most obvious one is, what in the world is a political party in the first place? 
Now we can look at the dictionary. Dictionary says uh, the definition is a group of persons organized to acquire and exercise political power. Now it's worth noting what isn't in there. There's no mention of ideology because political parties are nothing more than ideologically neutral vehicles. The political ideology is not built into the machinery of a political party. It's defined by who is in the driver's seat. So the next question we have to ask is, which, which car would we rather be in? And to ask that, we got to know where, where are we trying to go? What is your goal? And which political vehicle is more effective at getting you there? Now, I believe the, the goal of our liberty movement should be nothing short of trying to save America by restoring the principles of individual liberty in our country. And there tend to be two theories on how you do this. There's the education theory and the mobilization theory. And if your strategy is education, and I bet Dave and I would agree on this, there's really only one effective example of, of campaigns educating millions of Americans on the principles of liberty, and that was Ron Paul's presidential campaigns as a Republican. And if your strategy is mobilization, winning elections and changing laws and policy, then the most effective political vehicle is even more clear than that. In the last year alone, hundreds of candidates in the legacy of Ron Paul have won election to state legislatures across America, and all but one of them were Republicans. Now, in Wyoming last November, there was an LP candidate who, for the first LP candidate to win election to a state legislature in a quarter century, I think that that's certainly something to be celebrated. We should celebrate victories in the liberty movement wherever we get them. But the fact of the matter is that we live in a two-party system, and victories outside the two major parties are going to continue to be extraordinarily rare. Many say it isn't fair that we live under a two-party system, and I tend to agree with them, but you can't change the rules of the game unless you actually win, and we have to win. Now, the, the next question I would ask is, what do we actually get for controlling the Libertarian Party? If step one is taking over the LP, what's step two? How does this help us save America? Now, I understand the appeal. I think that part of the appeal is that taking over the LP is much easier than taking over the GOP. And I would say it's easier for a very specific reason, because nobody with any real power in America actually cares if we take over the LP. They aren't guarding it because it's not a threat to them. So we have to embrace the truth that the liberty movement has become a radical position in America, and radical movements do not win without radical discipline. Do you think that Bernie Sanders and AOC are wasting their time trying to infiltrate the Green Party or the Socialist Party or the Peace and Justice Party? Of course not. They know where the real power in uh, in America lies, and it's in the two major parties. And those who say we can't take over the GOP, that it's too hard, I'm here to tell you that I know that we can do it because I've done it before. In 2012, I worked with grass, that's grassroots. About five minutes. All right, I'll uh, I'll I'll, I'll yeah, take your time. Wrap no, up in a little bit. Thirty seconds or so. I won't go hard. But in on 2012, you. I worked with grassroots Ron Paul activists. We took over the main Republican Party by showing up in larger numbers at the state convention than the Mitt Romney establishment. Um, as a Liberty State Senator, I've already talked about some of the things that, that I accomplished there. But at the end of the day, look, who was I at the beginning of all this? I was just a Ron Paul Liberty activist trying to make a difference. If I could do it, anybody could do it. And uh, plenty more points to make, but we'll, uh, we'll make them as we go on. But ultimately, I just want to say the, because of the Trump movement, which is falling apart right now, the neoconservative grip on the Republican Party has never been weaker than it is before than it is right now. Sun Tzu said, strike when your enemy is weak. They are weak right now. They're trying to reassert control. Liz Cheney's being heralded as the next coming of leadership in the Republican Party. But the Republican Party voters don't want Liz Cheney. In fact, they, uh, they are very hostily against so many of the institutions that we've been against for so long. The war machine, the deep state, the corporate media, even the Republican establishment itself. If we get distracted right now by going after a third party instead of seizing the Republican Party right now from the bottom up as we're doing with these state legislative races, then I'm not sure that we're going to ever get an opportunity like this again in our lifetimes. Thank you. All right. That was former Maine State Senator Eric Brakey laying out his case for why the home of the Ron Paul Liberty Movement should be in the GOP. And now toss things over to Dave Smith, who will be speaking for the Libertarian Party being the home of that same Ron Paul movement. Dave, take it away. 
All right. Well, thank you to both of you guys. Thank you, Mark, for hosting another one of these things. And thank you so much, Eric. Uh, first of all, uh, I, I just I, I really can't express how much uh, gratitude and admiration I have for you, specifically for being the state director for the Ron Paul uh, campaign in 2012, which is just the greatest campaign in the history of America, as far as I'm concerned. And I mean, I, I salute you. And on top of that, you've already done a much better job than my last debate opponent. So congratulations on that as well. Um, so I, uh, let me just try to take on a few of the the points that you're making and 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 present the case for why I actually think while I agree with a lot of your points, I think the move right now is for libertarians to take over the Libertarian Party. Now, of course, you kind of uh, acknowledge this yourself, but you asked at one point what car you would rather drive. But that's not really the the entirety of the question. I mean, if I have a Chevy in my parking lot outside and then I have a Jaguar across an ocean, the question is not which car I'd rather drive. If I have somewhere that I need to get to very quick because I've got like a dying patient in the back seat, I need to take the car that I can take over immediately. And that's to me what what really all of this comes down to. Now, I look, I have enormous respect for you and what you do. And let me just say, first of all, I do not have anything against libertarians who are in the Republican Party. And I think that the LP should be strategic about this. I don't think we should be running campaigns against Thomas Massey or Justin Amash when he was a Republican or Rand Paul or something like that. So I think there's room for all those guys. And I think strategically supporting them at, at points does make sense. However, when you say that you know you can take over the Republican Party because you have done it, well, that's actually not true. And actually what happened is that you were on your way uh, to being a senator and John Bolton and these dirty bastards poured half a million dollars into a super PAC to make sure they could take that away from you. Now, the other point I would make is that defeating the neocons, um, first of all, neocons are like cockroaches. No matter how much you think you have them defeated, there's you, you see three of them, you stomp out, there's a thousand more under the carpet. They have control of reins of power that we libertarians, because we are boxed in by our own ideology, will never be able to have. You know, that this is one of the problems with the non-aggression principle if you really believe in it, it, um, it, it makes it that you can't really be Machiavellian in the way that people who don't believe in the non-aggression principle can be. But there's a whole other problem with the Republican Party, which is right-wingers. And, and you're going to have to deal with the fact that the, the Republican Party is not made up of libertarians. It's made up of right-wingers. And this is why Trump ended up winning. And this is why the best you're going to hope for here is to get some populist right-winger who you can be in the ear of. You know, you can be Rand Paul, who's whispering in the ear of Donald Trump, and we just ran that experiment, and we got nothing for it. Absolutely nothing. Less than nothing. I, I mean, like, the worst thing we could have possibly got. We got the biggest government in the history of humanity, every last one of the wars still going on, Americans locked in their homes all year long, and oh, by the way, he handed the presidency off to Joe Biden, the architect of all of the worst policies in America that we're all living under right now, a, a guy who could never get elected as president until this disaster, uh, this disastrous year, which like it or not, Donald Trump presided over. Like it or not, Donald Trump, the anti-neocon, the populist right wing energy that you're talking about capturing made the guy who poured half a million dollars into your race to destroy you the national security advisor. OK, he did it. He didn't listen to Rand Paul. He listened to him. So here's the deal. We are in a situation now, and this was right at the core of what Ron Paul always said. It's a bitter pill for libertarians to swallow, but it's something that we better we better swallow. There is no political solution to this. The, the idea that we're going to get in there, we're going to elect somebody who will get into the halls and roll back the state. Look, Donald Trump was not a threat to power the way a President Ron Paul would be. And look how the deep state boxed him in. They framed him for treason for three years. They made sure he couldn't get anything done. You Can you imagine what it would be like if Ron Paul actually got in there? He'd be taking a limo ride through Dallas real quick. OK, this, there's not going to be a political solution to this. The country is on a suicide mission. As Ron Paul always told us, this system is going to collapse and our chance will be after it collapses. The goal here is can we wake up enough people before that happens that we have a chance of rebuilding something better in the image of liberty? That's the only goal. Now, you, if you want to, and everybody knows, I mean, this country's on a freaking suicide mission. This thing is unwinding very quickly. If you're talking about 
taking over the Republican Party That's and making. Line. Okay, if you're talking about taking over the Republican Party and making it a libertarian party, you're looking at a 30-year battle that you'll still probably fail at. If you're talking about taking over the libertarian party, all we need to do is make the decision and it's ours. If every Rothbardian, every Ron Paulian, every radical libertarian joins the libertarian party, it is ours. We have the third biggest party. We can use it as a platform to spread these ideas and we can wake up millions of people. All right, Dave. Thank you very much. And the first thing I want to dive into a little bit further uh, is something you sort of mentioned there at the, at the end there and that, that Eric also mentioned uh, in his opening statement. And this might really kind of tie into figuring out what your each of your philosophies are for what the liberty movement should really be, even be doing. Um, but that, that is the idea that, Dave, even if you are successful in, you know, quote unquote, taking over the GOP, uh, the, GOP the, the Libertarian Party and, uh, you know, making it the, the true home of the Ron Paul liberty movement, uh, what many, including Senator Brakey, would say is, so what? Then what? What do you do with that? Because you're still in the situation where the political system is rigged. Uh, it's impossible to get ballot access. The media is going to ignore you. So what do you actually plan to use the Libertarian Party for? Um, were you successful in convincing everybody today that that's the best place to put all the energy? If really even people that are now involved in the GOP shift gears, they heard this podcast, they said Dave was right. Everyone goes to the LP. They, they, we take it over. It's the real home of, of the liberty movement. But then what? That is the real question. Well, well, I think that, look, the, the reason why Ron Paul ran as a, a Republican, because, you know, he used to get asked this question all the time. Um, why are you a Republican? Because you're obviously a libertarian. So why not run on the libertarian party? And he would basically say, because the rules are, are rigged. And the only way to get on the debates and get in front of millions of people is to be a Republican and get on the debate stage. And he was absolutely right in 2008. But if you're looking at the presidential election of 2024, you know, that's 16 years later than 2008. This is a different time. And the truth is that I get on the biggest shows in the world. And I've, I've gotten in front of millions of people in the last couple months. The, the Libertarian Party doesn't need to play by the old games. They're, they're, we don't have the same restrictions anymore. We have the internet. We have huge shows. We have social media for now. Um, and so I, I just don't think that the old rules still apply. So if the if we're looking to follow in the footsteps of Ron Paul rather than Rand Paul, okay, um, because we see the success of both of those, Ron Paul was about changing people's minds and introducing them to these new ideas. Rand Paul was about playing within the Republican Party and trying to gain status and trying to be in the ear of the president. And we saw how both of them worked out. And I think that the Ron Paul uh, strategy is the way to go. And I think we're best suited to do that in the Libertarian Party now. And I would just mention that the fact that Ron Paul ended up running as a Republican, I mean, look, Ron Paul ran as a, a Libertarian and then ended up running as, as a Republican later. Pat Buchanan, Mr. GOP, ended up going third party ultimately. If Ron Paul was 20 years later and kept this thing going, there's a very good chance he could have gone back to the Libertarian Party. You have to kind of judge the moment you're in while you're in it. And I think that right now is the perfect time for a third party to come along. There's Most Americans are sick of both of these two parties. And as the system fails more and more, it's going to become more evident that the two parties have failed. Senator Brakey, would you care to respond to that? Yeah, so I want to push back on a few things that were that were said um, in, in Dave's opening statement. First of all, I, I want to push back on this idea that um, a lot of people didn't vote for Trump because of what he was for. They voted for Trump because of what he was against. A lot of people voted for Ron Paul, sadly. I think we voted for him. We supported Ron Paul because of what he was for. He was for liberty. But also at the time, a lot of people supported Ron Paul because he was the biggest middle finger you could give to the establishment. In 2016, sadly, the biggest middle finger you could give to the establishment was not Rand Paul. It was Donald Trump. And now what, I, what I'm getting at here is that there, is, uh, there are a lot of voters in our American society who are just – who are – not clearly ideological. To say that to say that the problem is we're not going to be able to get these people behind a liberty message because they're not for liberty. Well, what really was Trump uh, Trump for in a lot of the a lot of these things? It was he was against those those assholes in in Washington D.C. He was against the establishment, and people a lot of people followed him because of that. 
we need to have we need to marry the liberty message to that populist anger, just like Ron Paul was able to do. Uh, Trump, all Trump had was the populist anger. He lost the principles. Uh, but we, but we need to marry those two things. You know, one of the things that I've, I've, I've found in politics is that folks like you, Mark, and Dave, and myself, folks who have a very clear ideology of what we're for, sadly, we're, we're, we're rare breeds. Uh, a lot of people are just following the person who sounds like they know what they're talking about, uh, and. Uh, and I see this not just as far as voters go, but as far, but also as far as even folks in the legislatures themselves go. So this idea that that uh, the neocons are everywhere, that you 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 get rid of one neocon and another one's going to be there in Congress. Really, how many folks in Congress would we actually say are real ideological neocons? You know, I bet you find like an actual like a couple dozen. The problem is there's 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 not a couple dozen. Uh, liberty-minded folks. We've got a, a few handful in Congress and in state legislatures across the country. That's what we need to build. But the vast bulk of the middle of these elected officials, just like the vast bulk of the middle of voters, are just following people who sound like they know what they're talking about. I've seen it in, in the state legislature in Maine. Um, I was able to get huge coalitions to pass things like constitutional carry and welfare reform and medical cannabis and and right to try an idea I got from the 10th Amendment Center listening to the Tom Wood show you know because I stood up there and 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 people people were like well geez this guy sounds like he knows what we're, he's we're talking about we're, we're going this way the sad truth is that most of the folks in politics these days most of the folks most of the elected officials aren't there because they had a clear idea or vision of government it's not because they had a clear neocon philosophy or clear libertarian philosophy they got they got there because they were popular they were a popular teacher or a popular tennis coach and someone recognized hey people know you they like you you can win an election and so they get there and they don't know what to do. And so they just follow the people who seem like they know what, what they're doing. We can be those people who get there and know what we're, what, what, uh, we're doing and folks will follow our lead. But so I'm a, I'm a little bit confused. So I, I just wanted to ask, so like, are you saying then that we need to just seem like we know what we're doing or that we need to be the biggest middle finger? Because the problem I'd have, and this really is a question, I'm not just using mm -hmm. it to, to rant. Um, but the problem that I think you're going to run up against is if there is a right wing populist like a Donald Trump, you're never going to be able to be a bigger middle finger than him and still be a libertarian. Because by its very nature, libertarianism is kind of a compromise ideology. It's like you don't get to enforce your will on other people, but you get to do whatever you want to. That's kind of the libertarian compromise. That's what the non-aggression principle is. So if Donald Trump is willing to get up there and say, deport them all, deport every illegal immigrant you have, how do you as a libertarian become a, bitter, a bigger middle finger than that? By identifying the other issues that we can be the biggest middle finger on while, while sticking to principle. Uh, Ron Paul achieved that by being the biggest middle finger to the Federal Reserve, by being the biggest middle finger to the war machine. You know, Rand Paul, who I love and I consider a, you know, a mentor and someone I look up to, I think you're right. He made a strategic mistake in trying to, uh, trying to temper the message and make it a little bit more establishment friendly. But the establishment was never going to get on board with him. And, uh, and the folks who were looking for the anti-establishment candidates that you know, looked over at Trump, who was willing to, to, uh, to uh, you know, channel, channel the, that, that anti-establishment anger more. I so think how do we, how, I, I'm sorry, I just, I, I kind of yeah. want to know so I can take on this argument so I, I can see this. So you're saying that the biggest moment we had in, in the Liberty, you know, history was Ron Paul presidential campaigns. I completely agree. Um, who do we have? Who could possibly be that guy on the Republican Party who's actually going to to run and and be able to do this? I mean, uh, the the thing that I think we're missing here is that Ron Paul was so unique. Ron mm -hmm. Paul was able to get elected in this rural red district in Texas because he delivered everybody's baby. I mean, that was it. They couldn't demonize him because basically, like a fifth of the population had their baby delivered, like five thousand babies. So they were like, Ron Paul wants to legalize heroin. He's a heroin addict, and they'd be like, He delivered my two boys. I don't think so. And then he was like this cult hero for being around for 30 years. I mean, who do we have who's going to do that? Who's who's going to step up on the Republican Party and, and be this voice who will, by the way, I think still probably lose to a Donald Trump, as unfortunately, I think Ron Paul still would have lost to Donald Trump. What's what's the strategy here to have another Ron Paul movement in, in the Republican Party? Well, first of all, I think we need to, there is so much attention that's paid to the presidency. And I certainly think that 
the the opportunity of running folks for the presidency is a great educational moment, as we saw with Ron Paul. But it's not the only opportunity that's out there. One of the, the, the frankly, the best opportunities I see right now are people running for the state legislatures across the country, you know, and and we've been electing them by the hundreds. And these are folks. These are folks who become the populist heroes of the conservative base. I became a populist hero of the conservative base in Maine. A lot of the folks who uh, we're electing, uh, uh, and we've got Ron, we've got Ron Paul style Republicans elected now in 37 states, and still, and and. <laughs> One of the problems with the state legislatures in America is not that they don't have enough power to challenge Washington, D.C. and challenge a lot of these things going on in the country. It's that they don't have the appetite, the will, or the understanding of how much power they actually have. You know, people have to understand, you know, Tom Woods talks, uh, used to talk about it a great deal. They got to understand the power the legislatures have to nullify unconstitutional laws, like so many of these Ron Paul legislators who are getting elected to the to, to uh, state capitals yeah. today understand. And the the heroes, the heroes, I don't know who the heroes of the next moment are going to be, but I know that we're entering some pretty dark times right now. And the the silver lining of dark times as we enter them is that that's when heroes emerge. That's when people can stand up. That's when we find out who the new Ron Pauls are. And I think okay. that they are getting elected to the state legislatures today. So so I agree with you uh, that this is when we'll find out who the heroes are. I think that's a, a very good point. I think that you're wrong when you say that these state legislators actually have this power and they don't know that they do. I think they know very well that they don't have the power. And the fact that the 10th Amendment says that they have it is absolutely meaningless. It's as meaningless as Julian Assange saying, but the First Amendment says this. Power is, as Mao Zedong said, is derived from the barrel of a gun. And they will find out very quickly if they challenge the federal government that they, in fact, do not have that power. And one way or the other, we've got to start taking on that issue. And the truth to me is that if we're, I just don't think this nation is on a suicide mission. And I don't think, I mean, I think it's great that people are trying to take over state legislators and I wouldn't tell them to stop doing it. But I think what we need is a real Ron Paul type of revolution. I think that's what we need. And I think the only way you're going to get that is having somebody run on the presidential level that can use it as a megaphone, as a bully pulpit, and really communicate these ideas to a lot of people. So I'm not against anybody trying to win local or state races and whatever party. I don't Like you said, I don't care about political parties. I care about liberty. I just care about whatever the parties are just vehicles, you know, but what do you think, you know, is going to be the vehicle that can actually wake millions of people up? Because I think that's our only chance um, to actually make a difference here. And I think that's the Libertarian Party. Erica, and I would, how, yeah, go, go on, Mark. You can, give, you can respond to that real quick. No, and I would just say the Republican Party as a vehicle is what gives us the megaphone to reach the untold millions of people who, frankly, one of the sad truths of of where we are as a country and this is just kind of the tribal mentality that comes come just is a sad part of human nature is that there are so many people millions of americans who will not consider who will not look outside that partisan box uh, they're going to check the r or they're going to check the d and that probably accounts for about 60 percent of all the voters in america not only does that make it very difficult to win in a, in a, in a two-party system when you're running as a third party, if you got to go from, it's much easier to go from 30% to 51% than it is from, you know, 1% to 51%, especially when 60% of the vote is already mm -hmm. accounted for. Um, but but uh, on top of that, many people won't even, many, many folks, Ron Paul was able to reach those folks because he was able to go through this vehicle of the Republican Party and, 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 uh, that's what gave him access to these untold millions of people. I certainly wouldn't be here if Ron Paul had been running as a libertarian back then. I get what you're saying, kind of times have changed, but still at the same time, there are so many people who are still married to this two-party system. Uh, I wouldn't be here today. I wouldn't have woken up. I wouldn't have uh, uh, seen the lies of the neocons if it wasn't for Ron Paul uh, as a Republican standing on that Republican debate stage. Yeah, so let me just be very clear about what I'm arguing here. I agree with you. And I also wouldn't have woken up if Ron Paul hadn't run as a Republican. But that happened. He did that. Libertarian, he mainstreamed libertarianism. And now we can move to this libertarian party where we have social media, we have huge podcasts, we have all of this. Now, I will tell you, I this is what I think, right? I think that if Ron Paul had run into, let's say Ron Paul was a little bit younger, you know, which really was the only problem is he was just a little, unfortunately, he was just a little bit too old for the time that his movement exploded, which is the only negative thing I will ever say about Ron Paul ever. He just wasn't born on the right day. Um, but 
if if he had run uh, as a Republican in 2016, probably he does better than Rand, but Donald Trump still steals the day because he's just that famous, he's that brash, he's that aggressive, and he was just gonna suck all of the air out of the room. But if Ron Paul went and ran as a third party, if he ran on the Libertarian Party in 2016 after his previous two campaigns, because that's really what we're talking about, running on the Libertarian Party post Ron Paul revolution. And if he had done that, I think the liberty movement would have stayed alive and he would have had an unbelievable platform to pull people in who just were disgusted by Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump. He would have been the third option, which is a truly principled guy. The truth is, right, we've never seen because the Libertarian Party has kind of blown every opportunity they have, we've never really seen how much potential they have. What I need people to envision is, a, is, is someone, no one's gonna be as good as Ron Paul, but on a scale of one to Ron Paul, an eight rather than a three, you know, actually running for president on a third party, getting on all of these huge shows, killing it on all of these shows, that to me is our best chance by far. And I still think the problem you're gonna have in the Republican Party is that there's just more right-wingers than there are libertarians. And, and at the end of the day, we are not really right-wingers, are we? That's not really what we are. Now, don't get me wrong, I like talking to them. I've had more success pulling from them than I have from left-wingers, although some from each. But truthfully speaking, we almost have to dance around what some of our true principles are if we talk to right-wingers, because right-wingers are not libertarians. And that's what dominates the, the GOP, and that's why a Donald Trump is gonna beat a libertarian 10 out of 10 times. Eric, I wonder if you could speak to that a little more. It's come up a few times here. Uh, the GOP post Donald Trump or post this iteration of Donald Trump. Who knows if he's if he's done or if he'll be running again or if he'll be allowed to run again. Uh, but no matter what, we have 70 million people that voted for Donald Trump. Uh, the MAGA voter. 74. 74 million, whatever it may be. The MAGA voter, Dave's here to fact check. Uh, the MAGA voter <laughs> exists, and the MAGA voter is out there, and the MAGA voter, voter has a lot of passion and energy. So, uh, And a lot of people will say that, that this MAGA movement, uh, the Trump movement, has really destroyed any semblance that may have been left of the GOP being a party of liberty, um, you know, with all the very, very, very non-libertarian positions that Trump has taken um, on, on many different issues, uh, from health care to the border or what have you. Um, so, Eric, I wanted you to speak this specifically as the state of the GOP uh, post Donald Trump or whatever kind of state we're in right now after his presidency. Uh, how is is the GOP still after this a place where liberty can thrive, where where liberty can uh, you know become come to the forefront again? Whereas many would say after the, you know after this this uh, four years of Trump, the GOP is is so far far from something representing a liberty movement that it's just unsalvageable. I would say the GOP in a, a post, you know, an immediate post Trump era is much closer to the liberty movement than it was in the George W. Bush era. I, I think we, we are, we're talking about a, a, a time when uh, I think we've got the most fertile ground here we've ever had. And again, so many of the folks in the, the Trump movement, the MAGA movement, whatever you want to call it, it, it so many folks are, are motivated by being against particular institutions, institutions that we are in fact against. They don't necessarily always have the ideological reasons for why they're against it and why these institutions are bad. They just know that they don't like them. They don't. The, the Trump Trump has turned so many people against the war machine. We're talking about the deep state. We're talking about the the the, the corporate media. We're talking about how terrible Mitt Romney is. I mean, frankly, who do you think hates Mitt Romney more, Democrat voters or Republican voters? Frankly, I think the I think Republican base voters hate Mitt Romney more than a lot of libertarians I know these days. Thinking of Nick Sarwak here, you know, um, and so look. Obviously, a, a movement that is motivated by what it is against is back uh, is is lacking some real ideological footing. That's where it's our job to provide that ideological footing. Say, yeah, we're against that too, and provide people the reason why that's actually bad. Mm -hmm. You take what they're against and you say you justify that, and you say yes, and here's the reasons why, and now follow us to liberty. I mean, that's how that's how figures 
in um, that's how figures in the in the Ron Paul movement back in back in the Tea Party wave took me from being a neoconservative to being a uh, a Ron Paul libertarian by saying, yeah, we're against the 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 you know, hey, we're all. I remember Jack Hunter used to say, hey, we're all against these these federal bureaucracies. These federal bureaucracies are bloated, and you know, the Federal Department of Education is a complete waste of money. We all agree, we all agree with that that it's a uh, it's a bloated, wasteful government program. So where's the special fairy dust that we sprinkle over the Department of Defense that makes it anything else other than a, another bloated federal government bureaucracy. And you start saying, you, 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 you harness what people are against, and you provide the philosophical underpinning, and you lead people towards towards liberty. It's it's um, that's, that's how Ron Paul was effective. That's how many folks were effective. You got to meet people where they are, and you got to give them, op- and, and you got to you gotta lead them to liberty. Sure. No, look, I completely agree with that, right? I mean, and you know, we're both on the same page with that. I mean, that's what I do. That's what I do every single day, right? Is talk about what you're against and why you're right to be against it. But here's the real reasons why you should. And here's what you should be for rather than just being against uh, something. This is something Mises talked about was a a, a criticism he made of right wingers back when when Mises was, you know, before he even came to America, he was writing about this stuff. So I completely agree with you on that. And you're right that at the moment, Republicans really hate Mitt Romney. They also chose Mitt Romney over Ron Paul not that long ago. They also chose John McCain over Ron Paul not that long ago. Now, that's not to not give them credit for being better. I mean, my argument isn't that we shouldn't be talking to these people. And I think you're probably right that the Republican base is in a better place now, that certainly than they were in the George W. Bush years. But here's the problem. It's the same problem with libertarians kind of feeling like the left was our ally during the George W. Bush years. Yeah, they're really against the same thing we're against, but they're really not for what we're for. And if you wanted to find that out, let there be another 9-11 style attack and you would find out real quickly the big difference between us and the Republican base. Can you imagine? I mean, thank God Donald Trump's out of there in five days, if, if not sooner or whatever. Um, but, you know, my big fear through the Trump um, it, uh, presidency was that there would be a terrorist attack because, my God, can you imagine what Trump's reaction would have been? Had there been a terrorist attack, he would have had to drop the biggest bomb. He would have had to invade triple the countries George Bush did just to prove what a big dick he has or whatever. And the right wing Republican base would have gone along with him lockstep because he is their God. And they do not. They like like you said, they don't work. They they worship him. And it's not for any principles that he has. It's because he opposes all of the things that they oppose. And so the problem we're going to run up against is that these people are not libertarians. And at least in the Libertarian Party, I mean, it's funny, the irony of this, this debate, what's really hilarious about it is that we're both sitting here defending parties whose leadership hates our guts. But, you know, like, we're like, no, but mine's better. But at least my leadership isn't blood soaked monsters. You know, so like, you've got a you've got a nicer car Just because they haven't had the opportunity to actually wield any power to be blood soaked monsters. Yeah, but listen, you, listen, I understand what you're saying. But you can't tell me that you wouldn't rather have look, after 9-11, George W. Bush and Dick Cheney literally slaughtered hundreds of thousands of people. After 9-11, on September 12th, 2001, Harry Brown wrote what is one of the greatest pieces yeah. of writing in American history. So you can't convince me that there's no difference between how the Libertarian Party would handle that type of power versus someone else. But again, that to me is kind of a moot point because we're never going to be handling that type of power. But what we can do is is get enough principled people together. I mean, the Libertarian Party is already, I mean, the Mises Caucus is 40% of the party. Uh, the The there's at least 60% Rothbardians in the party. What's going to happen over this next year as the recruiting drives up, it's going to be 75 to 85% hardcore Rothbardians minimum. And then we actually have a vehicle where we can insert our narrative into the discussion. And I got to say, like, look, obviously these things are kind of cyclical. And at different times, people, you know, at one point Rothbard was in the Libertarian Party. At one point he was supporting Republicans. At one point Ron Paul was in the Libertarian Party. At one point he was supporting Republicans. Pat Buchanan left and went third party. Ralph Nader left and went third party. You know, there's all these different... Right now, to me, it seems to be a time where the Republican Party is on the verge of collapse. The Democratic Party has its own civil war that's brewing is, and, and is going to come. I understand the argument that we could capture one of these parties, but that is a daunting, daunting task. 
whereas we can just decide to capture the Libertarian Party, and it's ours. And I think that is the move right now. The problem is that both of these two major parties, they still have all of the problems that even if the Republicans have gotten a little bit better with Trump, there's still a consensus over the government getting bigger and bigger and bigger and nobody really trying to tackle that. And this whole culture war that we're living through, it's all about that. That's what's at the center of it, is that the government got so big that now we have to fight a culture war over who gets to wield this power. We need to be our own thing that is, because the truth is we're not right-wingers or left-wingers. We're libertarians and we need to insert that into the conversation. And the best path of doing that is to not be left-wingers or right-wingers. The truth is, Eric, and I know if I pressed you on this, there's probably fucking 12 issues where you're more of a left-winger than a right-winger. And so, you know, like, it, it just makes more sense for us to be libertarians and let the chips fall where they may, as Tom Wood said, who is a member of the Libertarian Party, as Ron Paul has endorsed the Mises Caucus and endorsed our chair candidate in 2020, Josh Smith. This is the move for libertarians. So let me say this. I think that, um, you know, in economics, there's an idea called opportunity cost. Mm -hmm. And if the choice is between, if the choice is between sitting on Facebook and trying to win Facebook arguments or taking over the Libertarian Party, I would say, obviously, taking over the Libertarian Party is more productive than doing effectively nothing to advance the cause of liberty. But if the choice is between taking over the Libertarian Party and winning elections to state legislatures across the country, actually capturing political power to, to, to institute actual liberta- li- liberty, um, liberty ideas into actual, into actual law, mostly by repealing laws and repealing government programs, then that's clearly the better outcome. What I see here is the problem is The fate of the country is going to be decided in Republican primaries, and if we are telling all liberty-loving people to join a third party that would prevent them from running for office as Republicans, voting in Republican primaries for those who can run as Republicans, then those who are trying to, you know, storm storm the cathedral over here just aren't going to be able to get the support they need. We're 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 diluting we're diluting our power, and we're essentially surrendering, you know, the the two major uh, this major party, again. AOC's movement, Bernie Sanders' movement is having a future and having a moment because they are infiltrating and taking over one of the two major parties. If we, it, we, can, we can say that you know, now's the time for a third party, but the structure of the system is not built for a third party. The structure of the system is not built to ever slow down or to ever give up power. If you haven't noticed, the structure of the system is designed to expand government power over and over again. And to compare AOC and Bernie Sanders, yes, it makes sense for them to use this strategy. What's the, is the uh, Fabian? Is that the, the term that I'm looking for? The Fabian, right? the, Fabian, the, Fabian, the, Fabian yeah. the Fabian strategy, right? Of where instead of going for the, the communist revolution, you go in and you try to incrementally, right? The kind of like uh, bring more and more socialism. Rothbard took this on uh, uh, back in the day in the in the 90s the problem with libertarians trying to implement the fabian solution is that or the fabian strategy is that you're going against the grain rather than for the grain look aoc and bernie sanders aren't really that much different than all the other progressives they're just a tad bit more progressive than them they're just saying no government grab a little bit more power and a little bit more power i mean bernie sanders isn't actually a socialist that's the, he's not arguing for government you know, control of the means of production. He's just arguing for a little bit more government and a little bit more government, a little bit more than the last guy had. By the way, if Bernie Sanders had won the presidency in 2008, I doubt the government would even be that much bigger than it is today. I mean, it's, it's really hard to imagine anyone expanding the government more than Barack Obama and Donald Trump had. Certainly over, uh, have. It, certainly over this last year, uh, Donald Trump is the biggest government president of all time in all of human history. That's what happens. That's, that's the nature of this system. Libertarians have to do something completely different. We, we can't just try to get in there and hijack this party and then, oh, we'll cut the budget by this and this and this. And I, I would say that, look, that what you're preaching, like this strategy, has been tried for my entire life. Uh, There have been people who really believed in smaller government who have been trying to win through the Republican Party over and over and over again. The strategy that I'm proposing is 
at most two years old. Uh, uh, two, two years ago, Mark, when we had that podcast where, where all of us came on because all the liberty influencers were joining the Libertarian Party in the post-Ron Paul movement, taking that energy, putting it all into one party. This is a brand new strategy in the internet age with people who get on the biggest shows in the world right now. This is a brand new strategy. The strategy of trying to infiltrate the, the Republican Party and use it to, to shrink the size of government. This is what I've been hearing about since I was born and it was going on 30 years before I was born. We are failed. at a, we are at we are at a point where this this strategy is working better than it's ever before. Right now, let's just look at a big something big that happened that probably that went kind of unremarked on, but happened in New Hampshire this 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 past November in New Hampshire. So first of all, Democrats controlled the 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 House and the Senate, and everyone was predicting that uh, that uh, Democrats were going to gain seats. Uh, Republicans not only took control of the House, the House and the Senate there, but it was because of Liberty Republicans. Liberty Republicans are now the majority of the majority in the state legislature in New Hampshire. Now, part of that is the Free State Project moving a lot of people in and building a big enough coalition, bringing bringing kind of the the the, the people resources there to make that possible. But this is but this is. But you know, th this is this is a case where now the Republican majority leader in New Hampshire is an outspoken Ron Paul Republican, and we're going to start to see some interesting things start to happen where we have actual, principled Ron Paul libertarians holding actual real political power through the Republican Party. They have more influence in 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 the decisions that are being made than the than the traditional GOP establishment now in the state of New Hampshire. Right. That's what that's what our what that's that's what our, our our movement has been building towards as this strategy of of uh, electing people through uh, through the place where the neocons aren't guarding th their gates so well uh, through the state legislatures is is uh, is is building towards. Well, I, 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 one thing sure, I just want to jump in here uh, on this one trend that I'm kind of noticing uh, between both of you. And I, I think it's maybe just a difference in how each of you are kind of viewing the role of, of politics here. Uh, because, you know, Dave, one thing you mentioned a bit ago was, well, you know, libertarians aren't going to have the power anyway, so it doesn't matter. And I, I'm kind of wondering if that's part of almost why, what you see as like an advantage of the Libertarian Party is that, you know, most people in the Libertarian Party ha either just kind of realize the position or they're not, they don't have that sort of Machiavellian sense. So there's more of that freedom to actually be out there giving the bold message. There's not so many people in their ear saying, oh, don't say this because you have this vote coming up or what have you. So there's maybe a little more freedom to really be out there giving the boldest message possible. Uh, whereas Eric, you've really been focusing more on uh, where it comes to the GOP. Look, we have this infrastructure. We're getting people in office. Uh, we're getting people in those positions of power. And uh, as I'm just listening to this debate without really necessarily uh, having an opinion going in, I'm kind of just seeing like, the idea of, you know, one thing you had mentioned, Eric, too, is, you know, we're going to lose a lot of opportunity to influence politics if all of the libertarians are not voting in GOP primaries because you actually have to be registered Republican. Whereas libertarians, they, there are some states that kind of have primaries, but for the most part, they don't really matter. The stuff is determined at convention. So I'm just wondering, listening to all this here, is if if you really need to make a decision, if people out there need to decide one or the well, other. Well, yeah, and, and I, I should point out that I am not necessarily against. I mean, the rules are different state by state, like there's open and closed primaries, but you can actually be a uh, like dues paying member of the Libertarian Party and register in your state av as a Republican. And like, if that was to support Thomas Massey or Rand Paul or someone like that, I wouldn't necessarily be against that, you know, like, Eric I, Brakey, I, I, maybe. I know. yeah, sure. <laughs> like, yes, absolutely. I, I, I would think that would be quite possibly a very good uh, thing to do. But I guess that I'm hearing you, you say that, you know, like all of these Ron Paul people are getting in at the local level, and this is going to make a really big difference down the road. And look, I mean, I, I believed in, in the Jesse Benton delegate strategy in 2012. Remember, your state was ours. We owned it. The Ron Paul people yeah. owned it. I'm still waiting for those I secret was, delegates I, to show up. I, I, was, uh, I was actually one of those folks who was kicked out of the national convention oh, yeah. as a delegate. But Well, that's right. That's, so all, that's the Republicans... a whole other story for another day. Yeah, but that but that's kind of my point. Then the Republicans changed the rules and this strategy got pushed back another decade. And then it's like, okay, no, now we gotta we gotta start from, hold, from hold scratch. On. But the strat the strategy that we that we were pulling off worked for Trump four years later. Trump Yeah, the, but that's but but here's the point. That's what I call not working. 
Yeah, that's that's not it working. It worked for Trump. That's not working. That gave us the biggest government in human history with us locked in our homes. It's like that th that strategy did not work. Well, this is, ob look, obviously, you want tr tr obviously tr Trump is not a libertarian, and I'm not. Uh, but but I'm saying that that populist outrage was building and building and building. Sadly, it got co-opted by you know what what Ron Paul had built. That populist rage and and fury got co-opted by a guy who did not have the principles of a Ron Paul. Maybe maybe if Ron Paul had been younger and he had been able to run uh to to run uh four four years later i don't necessarily accept the premise that if ron paul had been in that uh in that um uh in there in 2016 that 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 uh uh it, it's automatic that that trump would have beat him i think that ron paul would have done a lot better than Rand paul um, well that i agree with i certainly think he would have done a lot better than Rand paul and i think that kind of proves my point that i think that Rand paul went with more of a machiavellian strategy of trying to work within the republican party and build up power within the republican party rather than just preaching an uncompromising message which is what ron paul did uh, ron paul said things that he knew would get him out with the republican party they offered him a prime time speaking role at the 2012 uh, republican national convention if he would just tone down these three things and ron paul in classic heroic ron paul fashion went no <laughs> like no i'll just talk to my own people but you know what ron paul proved he went uh, that, well, that was in 2008 i guess but he went and held his own convention i mean that's the libertarian path what ron paul did i don't need a compromise to get into your convention i'll go hold my own convention and now that's easier than ever like that's, I, I mean, it, we can speak to so many people. This is the problem that we had with Ron Paul of the media ignoring him. That's over. We don't need to care about that anymore. We can reach millions and millions of people. Like, look, I have gotten in front of in the last two months at least 11, 12 million people mm -hmm. that I, I've spoke to just from doing Rogan and Tim Just from Pool doing Lions of Liberty show. alone, yeah. Li just Lions of Liberty. Mm -hmm. And that's not even counting Rogan and Tim Pool. You know what I'm saying? So it's like, we have all of these other options now. This is not the time to compromise our message and water it down. This is the time to, to preach the purest message possible and, and to really explain to people what libertarianism is. Now, you're right in the sense that not everybody's gonna d go for that. But the problem is that th this is, the, I think, what the real issue is here, right? Is that your, what you just said before was that you think this strategy is working to some degree and i am telling you it is not this country is in a, a, a it's like i i feel like that you know we're on a plane that's in a tailspin just about to crash and you're like no but i'm telling you i'm working on this door and i think this is a good idea and it's like no this this isn't working the the the, the strategy of taking over the republican party is not working the trumpians have taken over the party and they are not libertarians well he, but here's the thing i mean the trump coalition is is it's a personality driven movement that is not grounded in any kind of real firm ideology no one is going to be able to hold that coalition together after Donald Trump. Well, I don't Donald know. We never I, saw I we never saw Donald Trump rising up, but I also don't know that I completely accept the premise that it's 100% personality driven. I mean, the truth is that Donald Trump actually in 2016 brought up issues and he really did run on several issues. Now, I certainly grant you that his personality was a big part of of his appeal um and also a big part of his, you know, hatred um but he, he look he said he wants to not look i'm not an open borders guy okay um but forget the like libertarian argument about open borders or not donald trump said he wants to deport every single illegal immigrant in the country it's probably somewhere in the neighborhood of 30 million people now he never had any you know, commitment to principles because he's Donald Trump and he doesn't have commitment to principles and there was no practical way to get that done. But he said, let's deport every one of them. Let's have an American Gestapo go round up every one of these tens of millions of people, rip them out of their homes and send them back to the third world where they came from. And the right wingers in your base, the people who rejected the neocons, they loved that idea. That is how anti-libertarian they are. Let's not kid ourselves here. I mean, like a, a lot of people in the Libertarian Party give me shit because I'm willing to have like conversations with some of those people, but I never kid myself about how the, they're, they can really be won over by a Libertarian message. I mean, you can pick people off the edges here and there, and that's what it's our job to do. But Donald Trump also vehemently opposed free trade. That is popular amongst the Republican base. The, a lot of these positions that he ran on are very popular amongst Republicans, and I actually think that they would probably win over the libertarian positions amongst the Republican base.
Eric? So I, I guess I, I, I would push I would push back. Um, I think some some of the reasons some of these things were popular is because he was saying it the loudest. I, I you know it certainly is. Um, again, I think I go back to a, most most voters are not ideologically driven. They're following the person who is against the things that they're against, uh, right? And oftentimes, what they're against changes radically from really just reacting against the other guys. They know that they're against the Democrats, and 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 what are the Democrats for? Well, I'm against that. Well, right now, Joe Biden and Kamala Harris and the Democrat Party is going is is pretty much everything that is the opposite of what libertarians are for. They're not even they're not even anti-war. I mean, not that they the, yeah. the Democrat Party was ever really anti-war. They just, you know, faked it to get people's votes for a long time. But now you have a Democrat Party that is openly embracing the war machine, openly embracing uh, openly embracing uh, you know uh, forever forever wars across the world. And now is the time to say to the Republican base. We're against those guys, right? We're against the Democrats. We're against the forever wars. We're against everything they stand for. And who is better at being against what the Democrats uh, stand for right now than the libertarian movement? We are the movement that can provide the intellectual basis for why we are actually against everything that 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 Joe Biden and Barack Obama. I'm sorry. Well, and <laughs> they're all interchangeable these days. Joe Biden and Kamala Harris. Uh, are, 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 are for. We yeah, can amen. Amen. I completely agree with you on that. But we're not arguing over whether the libertarian movement should say that we're against Joe Biden and Kamala Harris. But you know what? We're also against Donald Trump. And good luck saying that to your Republican base. Donald Trump kept every one of these wars going. What, it's unforgivable. Uh, Donald Trump better pray that there's not a hell after he dies because he will spend eternity there right next to John McCain for what he did to the people of Yemen. The Republic, the idea, you're absolutely right. The Democrats just pretended to be anti-war, but the idea that the Republicans aren't, I mean, I, I mean, they've kept every one of these wars going. And so, of course, the liberty movement should be telling those people that we're, hey, that's what you say when you talk to Republicans, you know? You say, hey, you want to really be against Joe Biden and Kamala Harris, then you got to be a libertarian because we're the most against them. But it's also what you say when you talk to Democrats that, hey, you guys are supposed to be the anti-war people. But the truth is that trying to turn either one of these parties, th this is the major problem with joining either one of these parties, and, and, and it's what Ron Paul and Rand Paul both found out, is that it's like trying to join a party and get them to shrink the power of the state. It's like trying to join a corporation and convince them to make less profits next year, or trying to join the mafia and convincing them that crime is really bad. It's almost an impossible, you know, um, it's an impossible endeavor. Hey guys, I, I, we're going to head into our, our closing statements in just a minute. But before I do that, I want to just uh, see if either of you have a specific question for the other that you, you haven't already asked. I know you've had a few questions in the back and forth here. But if either of you have a specific question to ask the other one that you have not yet heard answered, we can do that now uh, before uh, you know before we go to closing statements. So, Eric, I'll, I'll give you the chance first since, since Dave just spoke. So uh, what I'm hearing from Dave is – so uh, I think Dave takes uh, takes a view that the system is falling apart. I certainly think there are signs of that. Uh, but, I, but I think – but uh, so the system is falling apart. Therefore, it's not worth fighting for the institutions of power to try to affect things in the system right now. We just need to uh, try to educate people and, and put out the message and just wait for the system of, of, to fall apart. And hopefully somehow when it falls apart, we'll be in a position to – you know, uh, change things and, 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 you know, you know, uh, uh, well, we'll be in a position to change things once, once that happens, I would argue, uh, you know, I guess, I guess, Dave, my question for you is how does that actually work? How do you, how do you envision when things fall apart that, uh, that, that having the libertarian party is going to put us in a better position to, to, um, to, uh, make change in the aftermath of all that? Than actually taking over uh, uh, and and electing liberty leaders right now uh, with, through the most effective vehicle that's available to us, which is the Republican Party, as we've been able to do in state legislatures across the country. Okay, so so just to be clear, my view is that whether we attempt my strategy or your strategy, this system is going to fall apart. That's not just my view. That's Ron Paul's view. That's, you know what I mean? I think that pr pretty much anyone who understands Austrian economics is going to acknowledge that this is, we're, we're past the point of return. Um, so the, my point is that the best we can hope for 
is to convert as many people as you were converted, as I was converted, as Mark was converted. The, the best plan we can hope for is to introduce these ideas and persuade as many people as possible. I think if we want to live in a libertarian order, the big problem that we have right now is, you know what? There's not enough libertarians. And we need to introduce these ideas, speak to the remnant, as Ron Paul was talking about. Let's be clear. It's still a long shot. No one here has a plan that isn't a long shot. We're trying to rein in the most entrenched power in human history. But perhaps the system falling apart doesn't have to be the worst thing ever. I mean, as Ron Paul pointed out, the Soviet Union fell apart. That was the best thing that ever happened to those people, you know? So it, it's, it's quite possible that the system could fall apart and there could be some type of peaceful transition. And the more people that believe in peace, which is really what libertarianism is, the philosophy of peace, the more people who believe in that, the better. So to me, the most important question is not how do we get into the holes of power? How do we make more people believe in peace? So I want to, can I do, ask a follow-up question? Sure, so sure. I guess, so I, I agree with you that the system is falling apart we are on an untenable path. I mean, we're printing trillions of dollars out of nowhere. I mean, yeah, by by the very clear logic of Austrian economics, this is this is we 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 don't know the day, but the day is coming. The reckoning yeah. is coming. You can't do this forever. Um, but I, I I suppose I suppose the 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 question is, when that day comes, will we be in a better position to influence what comes next by controlling the Libertarian Party? or by controlling actual levers of political power in state legislatures where we can, in Congress where we can, to try to at least, again, everything's a long shot, we're not on a good course, but at least to be in a better position to try to nudge things in a more free direction when that moment of great change comes. Well, I, I, I guess I think it's a little bit of a false choice. I mean, I'm not completely against anybody on a state or local level assuming power. I mean, it's like, yeah, whatever. Run as a Republican, run as a Libertarian, whatever you want to. But I think the most important thing is that we bring more people to this message. The truth is that Ron Paul already proved to us that you can inspire millions of people through a message of liberty. And if we can do that, I think we can do that again. And that's our best goal, So, or that's our best chance. So so I think we should approach that. We should attempt that. So whatever people can do through the Republican Party, the Libertarian Party, hell, even the Democratic Party, if there's some conceivable way to do that, then sure, try to get in there and roll back the power of the state. I'm not against that. I'm just saying the most important thing we can do is reach as many people as possible. And the best way to do that to me is to take the Libertarian Party, which is sitting right there for the taking. All we have to do is make the decision to get it. We don't have to fight a 30-year war to try to take over the Republican Party where it's it's guaranteed th that'll be too late if we can even do it. So that, that's the, you, you're right in what you said before. There's no question the Republican Party is a better prize. It's a better car. You know, they've got more power. Um, but the truth is my plan is doable this month. If every Rothbardian, if every hardcore libertarian, if every Ron Paulian wants to join the Libertarian Party, it is ours and we now own that. And we've got a real strategy now where we can go out and spread the message. This, this plan is a, a 30 year attempt that I, I gotta say, I don't think will even work in 30 years. Dave, uh, before we wrap up, do you have any, any uh, more specific questions uh, for Senator Brakey before we move on to our closing statements? Okay, let me ask you: Are you going to call me a Nazi on Twitter tomorrow? <laughs> that's been it's been a theme right now that I've podcast. dealt with. If I do yeah, it, just it do will it be now. it'll be ironically. <laughs> okay, there you go. Um, so I would ask just to try to keep with tradition. Okay, so I I would ask you: Do you think there is do do you think there is a, a fundamental problem with the Republican voters? being anti-liberty. I mean, look, after all, we're not so far removed from the people who did choose uh, John McCain over uh, Ron Paul, who chose Mitt Romney over Ron Paul. They had the, the, a better version of Thomas Jefferson, and they chose John McCain over him. Do you really think that the, the majority of the Republican Party wouldn't follow Trump into a war if he, if he just decided that we have to go fight this war? Do you, th do you think that there are, is a real problem amongst the Republican base of being anti-liberty? I think there's a real problem in America in general in that a lot of people are sheep and they don't know what they believe. 
and they're following bad leaders. They're following bad. And I wish that everyone would wake up and say, I'm going to think for myself. The problem is that we are in a system where people are simply, we're being pitted against each other. We're being pitted each, you know, you and Michael Malice call it the cathedral. The cathedral is pitting us against each other. They're pitting American against American. And they've got us convinced that as long as we look at the other guy and the other party as, as, as the enemy, they can kind of manipulate us to, to stand wherever they want us to stand as long as we can be against the other guy. So, but understanding that reality, understanding that uh, you have uh, big masses of people who don't know what they believe. They just know that they're against the other guy. We have to be able to, uh, to, to, to create a message that shows, hey, you're against those guys. Well, if you're against those guys, you're for liberty. And, uh, and, and I, I've seen it time and time again that liberty champions through the state legislature, through grassroots activism, become champions, become heroes to the Republican base because we can articulate the reasons why. We can articulate the reasons why Jamal Harris are, uh, are, are really doing bad things to our country. All right. Uh, unless you have a, a follow up there, Dave, I think we'll move on to our, our closing statements. No, yeah, let's move on. All right. Well, uh, Dave, uh, I gave uh, Senator Brakey the chance to speak first uh, uh, when we did our opening statement. So I'll give you the chance to give your closing first. All right. I'm going to uh, I'm going to read a quote, if that's OK, if I can find it here. OK, let me. Uh, OK, here we go. In short, what we have alive in the United States is an updated and Americanized fascism. Why fascist? Because it's not leftist in the sense of egalitarian or redistributionist. It has no real beef with business. It doesn't sympathize with the downtrodden labor or the poor. It is for all the core institutions of bourgeois life in America, family, faith, and flag. But it sees the state as the central organizing principle of society, views public institutions as the most essential means by which all the institutions are protected and advanced, and adores the head of the state as a godlike figure who knows better than anyone else what the country and the world needs, and has a special connection to the creator that permits him to discern the best means to bring it about. I don't know if either of you guys know who, uh, who wrote that. That was Lou Rockwell speaking about the right. Uh, one of the reasons why my, uh, my last two debate opponents on this show um, just fall apart and embarrass themselves is because they're debating a caricature, a funhouse mirror version of me, and then they get up against me, and I'm really nothing like that because I'm just a libertarian. And I bet you would never hear one of the uh, uh, critics of Lou Rockwell read that passage. I, I recommend everyone go check out the article. It's called The Reality of Red State Fascism, which uh, is a brilliant piece that Lou Rockwell wrote. A lot of people talk about the paleo strategy, but very few of them mention what happened in the aftermath of the paleo strategy, where Hans Hermann Hoppe basically called the, the paleo conservatives, a bunch of Nazis, not in a hysterical left wing way, but just in the fact that he was like, you guys are actually pushing the economic, you know, program of national socialism. And this is the problem that we're going to have with the Republican base. Do we want to peel off as many of them as we can? Of course, we want to peel off as many Democrats as we as we can, of course. But the truth is that we are not Republicans. We are libertarians. And that's the issue that you're going to keep running into over and over again. Now, I think that throughout this debate, the real difference uh, between uh, our, our two perspectives is that you believe that this political strategy is viable, that we can keep winning, you know, local elections and, and eventually overtake this whole thing. And, and, and then what? I, I don't know. Eventually get into the federal government, rein back the roles of power from within the government. I just don't think that's how it's going to happen. I think that the way we have to do this is what Ron Paul did through an educational program, that we have to introduce these ideas to millions of Americans. I think they're ripe for it right now. And I think that right now, it is all about third party time. We can take over this party. I think that we have a real strategy that undeniably, I mean, no one's argued with me saying this. If we decide to do it, it's ours. We can take this. You're right. It's the car that nobody else wants. But you know what? We can take that car. Whereas you're, you're looking at a Jaguar across 
a, an ocean, up a, a mountain that we, it'll probably take us decades and we'll never even get to. Or we can take this car and we can jam on the accelerator and we can try to really introduce these ideas to millions of Americans. To me, that is our goal. We have to learn the lessons of Ron Paul versus Rand Paul trying to work within the Republican Party, trying to gain influence within the party. Look, I'll say it one more time. What did it get us? We've run this experiment. We just ran it over the last four years, and it, it resulted in the biggest government in human history. All of the wars continued. Uh, um, you know, the people being locked in their homes, for God's sakes, over the last year. And what did it do for libertarianism? What did it really do for our movement to have people working with them? I mean, look, I, I agree with you, Eric. I really admire Rand Paul, and he's the greatest senator in the history of the Senate. So I, I, you know, I'm, I'm not like here to take shots at him. But it broke my heart to see him speaking at those Trump rallies, to hear him, to hear Rand Paul speaking, adoring Donald Trump. We know what Rand Paul really thinks about Donald Trump. He told us in 2016, and he was right then. And, 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 you know, to hear him just praising Donald Trump is the biggest spender in the history of, of government. You know, remember after the first omnibus bill, oh, he was going to like veto the next one. No, he wasn't. None of that's true. Oh, all these hopes he's got. Well, is he going to pardon Assange? He's going to pardon, you know, no, he won't. He won't do any of that. He'll just go out. He'll probably pardon himself and his family. He'll go out like the bitch that he is. Um, and this is what we get. This is what we get for compromising and working with the Republican Party. They're not libertarians. Lou Rockwell knows this. Hans Hermann Hoppe knows this. Ron Paul knows this. This is why he endorsed the Mises Caucus. It's why he endorsed our chair candidate, Josh Smith. This is the path, man. We can take over this party and we can be what we actually are, libertarians, with a party full of libertarians. And yes, we have some problems in our party, but they're not the blood-soaked monsters that are the problems in your party. I'll, uh, I'll rest my case on that. All right. Senator Brakey, the floor is yours. Why should people go out there just aiming for that, that jaguar in the mountaintop? <laughs> well, first of all, again, Mark and Dave, thank you both. Um, it's been a pleasure to be on with you both. And look, as I said before, as Sun Tzu said, you've got to strike when your enemy is weak. The neoconservative movement, their grip on the Republican Party has never been weaker than it is right now. We have an opportunity. We're, we are, you know, I, I, Dave is, it seems to still be living in the moment where Donald Trump is president and the head of the Republican Party. And, you know, maybe there's a scenario where Donald Trump, I mean, there is that scenario that is still hanging out there. Maybe Donald Trump is floating the idea of running for president again in four years and people still look at him at the head, as the head of the GOP. Frankly, I think there's a big possibility that after kind of what we just saw happen this last week, he may have been effectively neutered, and we're going into a period where there is no clear leader of the Republican Party. The Republican base is malleable. There aren't clear principles. But you know what, at the end of the day, and Dave, I've even heard you say this on your podcast, Americans and Republicans especially still kind of know in their heart of heart, based on our, our history as a country and what we've been taught about what America is supposed to be, we kind of know that this is supposed to be about freedom. This is supposed to be about liberty. And even if people don't quite understand and know exactly what that means all the time, those are the core values that we still have just in our DNA as Americans and Republicans especially so, even if they forget it sometimes and they don't know what, it, what it's really all about. It's our job. It's our job to provide the intellectual framework and structure to, to, tell, to tell people this is what it's about. This is what liberty looks like. This is what America looks like. This is what freedom looks like. And it's the opposite of everything that Joe Biden and Kamala Harris are for. So if we, so all of these folks who know that they, they because the talking heads on Fox News or whatever, tell them that you know Joe Biden bad, Kamala Harris bad, we're here to tell them why they're bad. And we're here to tell them, and this is why the Republican Party should stand for liberty. We have never had an opportunity in our lifetimes like we have right now. We have never had an opportunity where the Democrat Party is so clearly aligned against everything that libertarians believe and Republicans are going to be looking for leaders to stand against them. This is our opportunity. If, if Ron Paul was only you know, 20, 30 years younger, I would say, Ron, let, let's, let's rally around Ron Paul and the Republican Party, and he could be that guy. But Ron Paul passed that torch on to all of us back in 2012 when he retired from Congress. And so now it's our job to be that guy, all of us. Again, when I got into all of this, I was just a young Ron Paul activist who wanted to make a difference. 
I ran for state Senate as a Republican. I beat a 36 year Democrat incumbent. I got people's real, I helped, I worked with grassroots people, Republicans, conservatives, and we got people's real freedoms and liberties back. We got our gun rights back with constitutional carry. We got our cannabis, we got medical cannabis expanded on free market principles and people's lives have been enhanced but, uh, tremendously because of that. We got terminally ill patients in the state of Maine and now across America because I got it in the Republican national platform, you know, freedom principle, this, this right to try idea I got on the, from the Tom Wood show, got in the Republican national platform, it became a Republican issue. Donald Trump signed it into law. There are many problems with Donald Trump. He's not the head of the Republican party now. Now is the time for us to redefine what the Republican party is all about. This is an opportunity that we have right now. Heroes are going to emerge in the conservative movement uh, because we're, you know, because we're out of power right now. The people who stand up against what's go what's going on, what's going on today, and I think that those heroes and those champions should be lib liberty Republicans, so that we can redefine what Republicanism is all about, and frankly, get back to the roots of what Republicanism is all about. If you go back to you mentioned, you know, Ron Paul is the Thomas Jefferson uh, of, of, of our age. I completely agree. You know what Thomas Jefferson called himself and his movement was called? It was called the Republican movement. They called themselves Republicans because Republicans have historically always, well, supposed to be standing against centralized power and nationalized government. And people in their heart of hearts, there's something still in the American DNA and the Republican DNA that knows that this is what it's supposed to be about. So we need to go out and talk to those people. And look, and let me just end by saying this. My concern is when we have a mutually exclusive choice, when we say, well, we're going to go to the Libertarian Party and we're going to abandon the opportunities in the Republican Party because of it. Some people online I've seen in anticipation of this debate saying, well, why not both? Hey, look, if you are in a state, if you're in a situation where you can take over the Libertarian Party and the Republican Party at the same time, you can you can be a libertarian and vote in the Republican primaries for good libertarian people, you know, to uh, to 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 win those elections. Great. I'm all for that. But if at the end of the day, if you're in a situation where you're forced to choose between joining a third party in a in a in a in a, in, in a two party system that is built to make third parties irrelevant versus having the chance to actually win political power and actually get people's freedoms back in a real way. Look, I know that the system as a whole is crashing, but getting people's gun rights back, getting people's cannabis rights back, these are real freedoms that affect people's real lives right now. And if we have the opportunities to make a difference there, I think that we should take it. All right, gentlemen. Uh, well, there you have it. Uh, this was a little bit different than the previous couple uh, debates I had with Dave, uh, but I, I think in a good way, in a very productive way. And uh, this debate was so good, I, I don't even know who won. I don't even know who I'm rooting for. I'm rooting for you both. I'm rooting for liberty everywhere. I'm rooting for the Libertarian Party to be the home of libertarians and kick ass. I'm rooting for the Republican Party to become the most libertarian place on earth. I'm rooting for the Democrats to become libertarians. I want everybody to be libertarians everywhere in all, in all uh, political aspects. But um, I will, in the meantime... Let the fans, uh, let the fans who are the real winners, as always in these cases, uh, decide. Uh, the, the Lions of Liberty Pride, our patrons, of course, will get to hear this first and uh, vote on this too. I'll put a little poll up in our Secret Pride Facebook group. But I want to thank both of you guys for coming on and having, a, I'd say, what is a, a true, respectful, real debate uh, where we're actually really looking at. I know it's a crazy concept. We're actually debating the subject at hand and not just you know hey, what, what's this was nuts. On it's weird. I actually, I, I had to think feeling. in this one. Yeah. This is uh, this is yeah. unfair. But d dude, I seriously to to both you guys, thank you so much. I really enjoyed it and uh, and uh, uh, appreciate both of your time. Thank you, Dave. Keep uh, keep doing what you're doing. I'm a big fan of yours. I'm a big fan of yours as well, Mark. And uh, it's been a real pleasure, real honor to to be to be here with both of you. And time will tell uh, which strategy proves a little more effective because I know you're both going to be working hard on your strategies and on convincing other people to join you along the way. And uh, I'm I'm excited to watch it all unfold regardless of what happens. So, guys, thank you so much. Keep up the great work. Keep on roaring. <laughs>